We have a new Vikings history video out over on Purple Insider. In this one, we go over the greatest pranks of Bud Grant's career, including the time that he fake shot someone. Seriously. Click the card in the upper right corner or the link in the description to learn more. And now, on with our feature presentation. This man right here is head coach John Ralston. He spent five seasons with the Denver Broncos and was, at the time, hands down, the best coach in franchise history. For the first decade or so of the existence of the Broncos, they were the lapping stock of the AFL or the NFL, whichever league they played in. They were the only team of the original eight AFL franchises to never make the playoffs, and never even had a winning record before he got there, with the 1962 season at 7-7 seven seven being the only time that the Broncos even had more than five wins. But when Ralston got there, everything changed. No, the Broncos didn't make the playoffs under his watch, although they absolutely were on pace to prior to his departure after the 1976 season after losing the power struggle with the front office. But they were a respectable franchise for the first time ever. Ralston paved the way for the success of the Broncos in the late 70s, even if he wasn't in charge to see it happen firsthand as he led the Broncos to three winning records in five seasons, and an overall record of 34-33-3 in that stretch, including a 9-5 campaign in 1976, where the Broncos played their best football in the over decade and a half long history of the franchise at the time. And obviously, John Ralston was a pretty good head coach. But of the 70 games that he was in charge of the Broncos for, and of the 70 games that he was manning the ship, which one was the best? Which one was the most dominant? And the one where the Broncos looked like they were playing chess, while the other team was playing Handyland? Well, that was a battle in Week 2 of the 1976 season against the Jets. However, half a century later or so, this game isn't necessarily notable for what happened during it, but rather, what happened after it. Because as it turns out, the most disgusted man about the performance from that game was none other than John Ralston. And not for the reason that you're probably expecting. And let's just say that you won't believe what he decided to do after the game as a result of his team's performance. Because it's impossible to imagine any other coach doing anything like this today. Because this is the story behind one of the most controversial running up of the score incidents if you even want to call it that, in the history of the NFL. Before I talk about what exactly this man right here, John Ralston, did during all of this, we need some context to understand how the game itself went. And before I go any further, I should note that, like I said before, this story is about a team supposedly running up the score. There are tons of debates about whether running up the score even exists and is a thing in the NFL. On one hand, having good sportsmanship is important, and running up the score and trying your hardest with the game out of reach could be considered classless and rubbing it in. On the other hand, these are professional athletes that we're talking about, and there's no such thing as running up the score when the other team is paid to stop you, and when you have a job to do. It might even be more classless and humiliating to not try, and to wave the white flag, and say you've had enough, than it is to continue to play. And as long as things like point differential, and points scored could potentially be tiebreakers, then you're not really running up the score. You're helping your own cause, because there are different levels to winning. I've gone through this debate before in previous videos, about teams allegedly running up the score, if you want to call it that. So if you want to learn more about that, you can do so by clicking the card in the upper right corner. However, I wanted to get that out of the way before even diving into this story, so we understand what the crux of the issue was and what the debate was here. With that out of the way, let's talk about the game and what was at stake. It's September 19th, 1976. It's week two of a brand new season and we've got a battle on our hands over at Mile High Stadium in the AFC 
between two of the original eight teams from the AFL days, the Denver Broncos and the New York Jets. This was a very big game in the 14-game season, because even though this was just the second week of the year, this had all the makings of a must-win for both of these sides. Both the Jets and the Broncos were 0-1, with the Jets losing 38-17 to the Browns and the Broncos laying an egg offensively in a 17-7 loss to the Bengals. So the last thing you want to do is start the season off winless after two weeks. Consider this. In 1975, of the eight teams to make the playoffs, not a single one of them was 0-2 after two weeks. There were no 0-2 teams to make the playoffs in 1974, or 1973, or 1972, or 1971, or 1970. Since the merger of the 48 teams to make the playoffs, not a single one made it after losing their first two games. So for whoever loses this game, even though we're still in the middle of September, and still technically in the summer, their season might be over. And fortunately for the Broncos, well, they knew the importance of this game, and they understood the assignment. Because when all was said and done, not only did the Broncos win, but they completely and utterly dominated. Outside of a 25-yard field goal by Pat Leahy in the first quarter, the Jets did absolutely nothing offensively, as they lost this game by a final score of 46-3 losing not just by 43 points, but losing by a whopping seven possessions. Even though Denver was a heavy favorite in this one, being favored by 13 points, no one saw this absolute bloodbath coming. The Broncos nearly tripled the Jets in terms of total first downs, winning that battle 31 to 11. The Broncos dominated on the ground, picking up a whopping 251 rushing yards on over 5.7 yards per carry, with the Jets having no answers whatsoever for Otis Armstrong and John Keyworth and Rick Upchurch. At no point during the game did the Broncos get sacked, so their quarterback, whether it was Norris Weiss or Steve Ramsey, stayed upright the entire game, with both guys posting a passer rating above 100. The Broncos outgamed the Jets 543 to 185 in total yardage, tripling New York's total output there, and tripling New York's output from a passing yards perspective, winning that battle 292-93. Denver scored four touchdowns in the first half alone, and the game, which was a 29-3 domination at the half, was already over with 30 minutes to play. On top of that, Denver's defense was exceptional. Joe Namath did nothing in the start, and when Richard Todd came into the game to relieve Namath, he was even worse, going 4 for 8 for 7 yards, no touchdowns, 1 interception, 2 sacks for 20 yards, meaning that the Jets had negative passing yards during the second half when Todd was out there, and a passer rating of 16.7, which is worse than if he did nothing but spike the ball into the ground on every single play. And whereas New York only had one play all game go for at least 20 yards, the Broncos had way, way more than that. I'll put it that way. When you combine touchdown runs from Otis Armstrong, Riley Odoms, John Keyworth, and Jim Kick, a touchdown catch from Haven Moses, and a pick six from John Rouser in what was his first touchdown ever as a Bronco, you get a route that nearly half a century later still lives on in Bronco history as one of the most dominant performances of all time by the team. And no, that is not an exaggeration. It was the biggest win of John Ralston's career, as never before had the Broncos under his watch won a game by 43 points. It was the first time in three years that they even so much as dropped 40 points in a game. The Broncos had taken their fair share of beatings over the years, but to be the ones doing the beating and at this magnitude? Well, that was unprecedented, as this was the largest win in Bronco history at the time. So you would figure with all of that, that this man right here, John Ralston, would be all smiles afterwards, right? His team just absolutely dominated, 
set a franchise record for largest margin of victory, and by a lot, I might add. And in a must-win game, after a sluggish offensive performance the previous week, completely answered the call and then some. Rolston had to be on cloud nine, right? Well, not so much. And it had nothing to do with Denver's attitude during the game or anything bad that Denver did. Rather, it was the fact that he was embarrassed that his team won by that many points. Of course he wanted to win the game, and that goes without saying. But he didn't want to win it like that. He didn't want to completely embarrass the Jets and rookie but still well-respected college head coach Lou Holtz off the field. In fact, Rolston had a ton of respect for Holtz on the other side. When Ralston spoke to reporters prior to the game, it was very clear that he viewed Holtz in incredibly high regard. As Ralston said before the game, we notice on the films that the Jets are as well coached as any team in the league. Their only problem seems to be a linebacker, but they even seem to have improved there. I look at the films of their linemen, their blocking techniques, the execution of plays, the coverages, the placement of people. Everything indicates this scheme Sunday will be a toss-up. Rolston genuinely liked Pulse, and believed that not only did he have the Jets going in the right direction, and not only that he was a technically sound head coach, but that he was going to be one heck of an NFL head coach. This was not just generic coach speak before a game. This was 100% real. And Ralston's team completely blew the doors off of Holtz's team in a game that wasn't even close. And Ralston was so embarrassed by this that after the game, he hand-wrote a letter, mailed it to New York, and addressed it to Lou Holtz himself. While we don't know the full contents of the letter, and likely never will, we do know two things about the letter. Number one, Ralston apologized emphatically about the game and bluntly said, we do not condone this type of play. And number two, any attempts by the Broncos to run up the score by calling passes in the fourth quarter were not called by him or any of his coaches, and instead were audible into by the backup players on the field, though Rolston admitted that he had a responsibility to stop it. I should note that the Broncos only scored one offensive touchdown in the second half of the game which was a rushing touchdown, seeing as their other scores in the half came on a 30-yard field goal early in the third quarter and on a pick six. So whether you can even call this running up the score, I don't even know. Regardless, Rolston wanted to make it very clear that this was terrible sportsmanship on the part of his team, and he regretted being a part of it and being responsible for it. Which raises the question, what did Lou Holtz the recipient of the letter, think about all this. I'm not even sure that Holtz accepted his apology, seeing as Holtz said that Ralston had nothing to apologize for, that this was a complete non-issue, and that what he did wasn't even apology worthy. It's almost like when you make a big deal out of nothing, and you're replaying the incident in the back of your mind, and wondering why you said that to your friend, and your friend says, wait a second, what the heck are you talking about? That's what this was like. Because as Holt said to Ralston, you need not apologize for running up the score. If that helps your team's confidence, then it is super. It is I who must apologize for not fielding a better team. Translation, we're both pro football teams, and there's no such thing as running up the score. I should be the one apologizing for my team's performance. And not you guys. You guys did your job. We didn't. And that's on us. In other words, this was an extremely classy response by Lou Holtz. Granted, Lou Holtz's apology to this man right here, John Ralston, might have been the only good thing about the Lou Holtz era in New York. But it was still a good thing nonetheless. Just to recap everything that happened here. The Broncos win by a ton of points. Their head coach apologizes for winning by so much, and the losing coach accepts the apology, if you want to call it that, and apologizes to the winning coach for not fielding a better team. 
definitely a bizarre situation to say the least. It's sort of similar to what happened between Joe Gibbs and Chuck Knoll about a decade later in the game between Pittsburgh and Washington, in a situation that you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. Regardless, I guess the old saying by Herm Edwards about you play to win the game doesn't always apply. Because in the eyes of John Ralston, you play to win the game, but not by too much. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.